Good morning. I have been working on a project to see whether I could convince myself that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. I think I've been on this project ever since I heard episode 424 of This American Life. Here it is in Act 2. As adults battle over how climate change should be taught in school, we try an experiment. We ask Dr. Roberta Johnson, the executive director of National Earth Science Teachers Association, who helps develop curricula on climate change, to present the best evidence there is to a high school skeptic, a freshman named Aaron Gustafson. Our question, will Aaron find it convincing, any of it convincing? Now here's my problem. I had no particular reason to doubt carbon dioxide's heating's effect, but I also realized I had no way to convince someone who wasn't already convinced. The evidence generally presented or er, the evidence presented was not causality but correlation. If I tell you that ice cream sales rise in the summer and shark attacks rise in the summer, you have no particular reason to assume that shark attacks cause ice cream sales or vice versa. It is the same way with carbon dioxide emissions and global temperatures. Maybe the carbon dioxide emissions are causing the temperatures to rise, but maybe not. Okay, the arguments used to support global warming in the media are, are uh, one, the one I've already mentioned, um, wait, I already wrote that down here, uh, CO2 emissions are up and temperatures are up, therefore carbon dioxide emissions cause temperatures to rise. That I call the correlation equals causality fallacy. Um, the second argument, 97% of Scott scientists agree that carbon dioxide causes global warming, and now, a lot of people would argue that this is not the no true Scotsman fallacy. Um, it's an informal fallacy, an ad hoc attempt to retain an unreasoned assertion. Um, when faced with a counterexample to a universal claim, it says no Scotsman would do such a thing. And then they see a Scotsman do it, and then they uh, change their they change their rhetoric. They say no true Scotsman would do such a thing. So this idea that 97% of scientists agree that carbon dioxide causes global warming, it kind of sets, um, it kind of just says, okay, if you don't agree that carbon dioxide is global warming, causes global warming, then you're not a scientist. And whether it is or is not the no true Scotsman fallacy, some people say it's not because they've got a different uh, definition of scientists, um, it sounds like the no true Scotsman fallacy to anybody that doesn't understand how you're defining scientist. Um, the third argument is an economic argument. If we cut emissions but we're wrong, we still have moved away from non-replenishable fuels. That's great. Um, I totally agree with that, but if that is the argument that we have, that's the argument we should use. Uh, honesty is the best policy, and it doesn't support the case at all that carbon dioxide is greenhouse gas. But none of those reasons are helpful at all to a science teacher. A science teacher needs to present some kind of testable scientific principle and observational data which will lead to an inevitable conclusion. So when I heard this episode of This American Life, they asked Aaron Gustafson, um, what would convince you she said she didn't know. And I heard the episode, and I heard the arguments of Dr. Roberta Johnson, and I realized that none of the arguments presented were causal. And I started asking around if anybody could make a convincing case for global warming, or just explaining why carbon dioxide was a greenhouse gas. Well, over the last couple of years, I've learned some of the concepts needed to approach this question. The Stefan Boltzmann's Law bond albedo, infrared emission and absorption spectrum, and the Planck emission spectrum. Sometimes that's called the black body emission spectrum. These four ideas, which you may never have heard of, are really key to understanding what causes carbon dioxide to be a greenhouse gas. Stefan Boltzmann's law looks like this. P over A power divided by area equals sigma times t to the fourth. Sigma is called Stefan Stefan's constant or Stefan Boltzmann's constant. It's 5.67 times 10 to the negative eighth watt meters squared per Kelvin to the fourth.
In words, the intensity of all the electromagnetic radiation coming up off a surface is proportional to the fourth power of its surface temperature. As an example, you can use, um, you could find the total power radiating from the sun by multiplying its surface area times sigma t to the fourth. The surface area of the sun is pi 4 pi r squared 4 pi r squared um, times r sigma times its surface temperature and you can plug in the radius of the sun which would be 695 times 10 to the sixth 695.8 times 10 to the 6 meters and the temperature of the sun which is 5778 kelvin plug those two numbers into the equation there plug in 5.67 times 10 to the negative 8 there and you end up with power of 385 times 10 to the 24th watts so if I put the sun over here and have little Venus over here, Mars out here, um, Earth somewhere in the middle, and we'll put um, Eris, or not Eris, um, Titan over here around Saturn, or not Saturn, that, I think that's Neptune? No, it's around Saturn, Saturn 6, the largest moon of Saturn. Anyway, that 385, whoa, those are way too big, 385 watts, or 385 times 10 to the 24th watts, which is a, a yatta watt. 385 yatta watts goes all over the solar system. Um, only a portion of that is received at these different um, locations. To find the intensity of the light at Venus, we will draw a big sphere around the sun at a dis with a radius of that, the distance between here, which is um, 0.723 astronomical units. So we would multiply that by we would multiply all of these by 150 billion meters because that's about what a astronomical unit is. So for Venus, we will divide by the surface of area of a sphere of 0.732 astronomical unit radius. For um, Titan, we'll be dividing that power that amount of power by the surface area of a sphere that is 9.582 astronomical units in radius. The resulting intensity I have here labeled as input intensity is measured in watts per square meter. This would be the intensity of sunlight directly overhead. This would be the intensity of the sunlight directly overhead if you were somewhere between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn on that particular day of the year where the sun is straight up at noon. If you're like me and have never traveled south of the Tropic of Capricorn, um, you have never seen this happen, or Tropic of Cancer. But if you're there, the intensity of the light from the sun is 1361 watts per meter squared. Now what I'm going to do with that input intensity is divide it by 4 to get the black body output intensity. And the idea of a black body, the idea of a black body is that it takes into it takes all of the incident electromagnetic radiation, converts it to heat, and then so we've got this sphere here and it's going to take all of that input radiation, convert it into heat, and then output the exact amount the exact same amount of power, um, but this time it's going to send it out in all directions. So the input intensity actually turns out to be proportional to pi times the planet's radius squared, um, because that is the surface that it is facing the sun. The output intensity 
is the area of a sphere for pi r squared. So it is actually, so this output intensity, um, black body output intensity, is exactly this number divided by 4 in each case. We're using that output area to give an average. So um, then I'm going to take that output, that black body output area. Now, to find the black body temperature, we'll apply the Stefan Boltzmann uh, law again. Intensity is power over area, which is sigma t to the fourth. But this time, we're going to plug in this black body output intensity and divide by sigma, take the fourth root, and solve for temperature. That gives these values of temperature right here. Now for comparison, the values here are the uh, average surface temperatures given on Wikipedia for these bodies. 288 versus 278 for Earth, a little hotter than expected. 210 versus 225 for Mars, a little cooler than expected. 737 versus 327 for Venus, a lot hotter than expected, and 94 versus 89.9 for Titan, just a little hotter than expected. Now this already seems pretty complicated, right? But there are still two phenomena that we have not yet accounted for, bond albedo and atmospheric absorption. Bond albedo is almost the opposite of the greenhouse effect. You'll see in every description on Wikipedia there of a planet or moon or something like that, they have, ah, here it is, an albedo listed. Um, for Titan, just albedo. I don't see it separated. For Earth, they've got the albedo separated into 0.367 geometric and 0.306 bond. The bond albedo accounts for all the light scattered from a body at all wavelengths and all phase angles, and it is the fraction of power in the total electromagnetic radiation incident on an astronomical body that is scattered back out into space. So earlier, you recall, I drew this diagram with the input radiation from the sun coming in being 100% absorbed by the Earth, converted to heat, and then being re-radiated re in all directions. What the bond albedo means is that, a is that a portion of that incoming radiation is reflected and does not contribute to the heat. So, from the black body output intensity, we will subtract 30.6% of the output intensity from Earth, 25% uh, of the output intensity from Mars, 90% of the output intensity of Venus, and 22% of the output intensity from uh, Titan to get the remaining output intensity. That remaining output temperature is associated with a cooler average temperature. Temperature equals uh, the f intensity over sigma to the four to the one-fourth power, um, which would be the average temperature if the uh, planet were not insulated by the atmosphere at all. 254 Kelvin for Earth, 209 Kelvin for Mars, 184 Kelvin for Venus, and 84.5 Kelvin for Titan. Now we have a certain consistency. All of these non-insulated temperatures are below the surface temperatures reported on Wikipedia. Now we can discuss why all these temperatures are higher than one would expect based on their albedos and the distance from the sun. Before I discuss why, though, I just want to quantify it. Um, we have a ground output intensity and a space output intensity. The ground output intensity is based on the Wikipedia temperature. Um, it is power over area, this is the intensity 
equals sigma times this temperature, the measured ground temperature to the fourth power. On the other hand, the space output intensity is identical to this remaining output intensity. This model assumes that the total intensity coming into the system is exactly equal to the intensity going out. So you've got the intensity coming in from the sun. Some of it is reflected, some of it is absorbed. For that that is absorbed, some of it is trapped and some of it is re-emitted into space. Hypothetically speaking, if all of the heat were trapped, none of it was re-radiated into space, this power would just keep coming in here, heating this up, and it would increase the temperature towards infinity. However, that's not what's happening. Instead, we've got an equilibrium condition where the same amount of heat is escaping as was entering. So I'm going to go ahead and add a reflected intensity here. To, uh, you know, let me try uh, this again and see if this makes sense. We've got this, the sun apply, um, supplying enough energy to make the Earth glow at 340 watts per square meter. Then 104 watts per square meter are reflected out by the albedo. That leaves 236 watts per square meter to be um, absorbed and re-emitted as thermal radiation. However, over time, that, that energy is captured by the atmosphere, so the next time it comes out, it comes out at 237, and comes out and reflected until it becomes 238, or actually, in the end, it comes to an equilibrium at 309, 309 watts per meter squared. No, 390. Am I reading that right? Yeah, 390 Kelvin uh, is what? No, that says 330. Let's bring that back down here so we can see it. It's 390. Uh, 390, it's not Kelvin, that's uh, watts per meter squared. That was where my confusion was coming from. Watts per meter squared. So in the end, it's 390 watts per meter squared, but still we have that 236 watts per meter squared. That original 236 watts per meter squared, that is approximately what is escaping off of the sun so that we're not, um, so that that temperature isn't rising as we speak, but rather it's reached an equilibrium of 390 watts per meter squared. So to say that again, it has finally reached an equilibrium where 390 watts per square meter is leaving the ground, but only 236 watts per square meter of thermal energy is escaping the top of the atmosphere, along with the 104 watts of watts per square meter of reflected energy. So when I uh, figure out the greenhouse capture percentage, I'm comparing these two numbers. Uh, 390 watts per meter squared leaves the ground, 236 watts per meter squared leaves the, leaves the atmosphere. Um, the difference is how much is captured by the greenhouse. Um, 153.8 watts here. Uh, or 39.4 percent of the 390 watts per meter squared. That number varies. Um, for Venus, 99.6 percent of the energy leaving the ground is captured by the atmosphere. On the Earth, about 40 percent. On Titan, about 35 percent. Now, Venus, oh, I shouldn't skip Mars. Mars very, very little, only 0.31%, a tiny, tiny fraction of the of it is caught by its atmosphere. Notice that 
Mars's atmosphere is 0.6 kilopascals, where Earth's is 103 kilopascals. Venus's is 9200 kilopascals. So Venus has an atmosphere that is about 90 times denser than the Earth's, much taller, has much more opportunity to capture heat in that space. 96.5% of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. Um, with Titan, it hardly has any carbon dioxide, but it has methane, about 1.4% of its atmosphere at the in the stratosphere, about 5% in the troposphere, that's the lower part of its atmosphere. The final piece of the puzzle is Planck's spectrum, or the black body spectrum, and the emission and absorption spectrum of carbon dioxide and methane. In this image, I have the, uh, based on the wavelength of the light, not the wavelength, the wave number of the light, and the power output of the light. Actually, I think in a previous video, I discovered that this actually needs to be multiplied by pi. But overall, this is the uh, Planck spectrum. Uh, you can find this on Wikipedia, except it doesn't have the pi in there. The reason I say um, it needs to be multiplied by pi is because if you stick um, a temperature of 1 Kelvin in here and find the area under this curve, you will find that it comes out to be 5.67 times 10 to the negative 8, which is the uh, Stefan Boltzmann's constant. But anyway, the area under this curve represents the intensity of light. The area, under, the area under this curve is actually sigma times t to the fourth. So if the Earth was, say, 330 Kelvin, you would want to find the area under this curve to figure out the intensity of light coming from the ground. But if you had carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it would absorb frequencies of light between here and here, and the area of that curve would represent the amount of heat captured by the greenhouse gases. So what happens is that the ground produces all this radiation and all these different wavelengths, and then 39.4% um, of that radiation is absorbed by carbon dioxide and water and other and other greenhouse gases possibly. Usually you see a big chunk out of it here. A lot of this is just completely wiped out over in this area maybe and uh, you've got a few spikes coming down over here that are all kind of pulled out and absorbed before it gets out of the atmosphere. Now perhaps the discussion of these emission spectra and how the numbers actually square is too boring for TV but I think that is what it would take to make a convincing argument from causality.